The Sum of Their Parts, written by Hold My Beer. Chapter 3. It took several days before Hermione would look at Harry without a vaguely hurt, disapproving look in her eyes. On the third day, she deposited a heavy stacks of books in front of Ron on the floor of the library where they usually did their research, and Harry risked a cautious question. Hermione, healing spells, she explained. She seemed a little reluctant to continue, but did so nonetheless. You'll have to learn, Ron. Harry doesn't have the finesse needed, and I'm... I don't work well with those kinds of spells. Some of them have to be released at just the right time to work. They won't work if you force them every step of the way, and I don't think I can do that. Ron looked a little worried, but picked up the first book, a heavy tome full of spells and wand movements and pages upon pages of what might go wrong. I know a little from home. Mum knew the basics with seven kids, but this is... These spells can go really wrong. They're restricted for a reason. The Black Library had a few. I hunted down a few more. Hermione bit her lower lip. One of us has to learn, Ron. Preferably not Harry, since he's probably the one who'll need patched up. We'll all learn the basics, but one of us has to know the advanced spells. St Mungo's? Won't be an option, Hermione told them bluntly. Voldemort couldn't walk into St Mungo's for treatment, and sooner or later Harry won't be able to either. I don't think any of Voldemort's marked followers, save for Malfoy and Professor Snape, would have been able to. Malfoy could because he was acquitted, and the Professor because the headmaster vouched for him, but even then they never did. The Professor went to Madame Pumphrey, and Malfoy used a personal healer. Right now we have neither. Mrs Tonks has most of the training of one, but we don't know how she'll take Harry's new choice of career. It wasn't something Harry had ever considered, but Hermione was right. The right to treatment in St Mungo's didn't exactly include dark lords. Ron seemed to have realised the same as he rubbed his hand down his face. Merlin, I... all right. I'll need someone to practice on, I guess. I... Merlin, he repeated. The small injuries are easy to practice. Some kind of numbing charm and then cast whatever spell you're trying to learn the treatment for, Harry said. I guess the bigger stuff we'll consider when we get to that. He glanced at Hermione and halfway expected to get a disapproving look in turn for suggesting that sort of thing. Instead, she looked a little tired and resigned, but mostly determined. Ron looked at the books and sighed. Then he picked up the first one and started reading. The first unwanted publicity from the lawsuits hit in early February. The first publisher had made a deal to keep it out of the media. It was a minor company and only had a few books in the line of fire, and no one had paid much attention when those book had vanished. Most seemed to have assumed they were merely sold out due to Christmas. The second publisher was far larger and had far more invested in the boy who lived fantasy, and they had decided to bring it to the court of public opinion. Perhaps the owner had expected Harry to cave at the thought of being vilified in public. Most people apparently failed to comprehend that Harry was already used to being slandered by the press and had stopped giving a damn about the public a long time ago. The public was very supportive of the tireless defender of free speech and provider of boy who lived fairy tales at first. That opinion changed somewhat drastically when it became public knowledge that the owner of said tireless defender was a member of a pure blood family that had escaped Voldemort's time in power entirely unscratched. They had paid their expected contributions, of course, and had to remove their stock of books related to undesirable number one, but that did nothing to endear them to a public that had suffered through a Death Eater reign of terror and the loss of family and friends. The office of Augustus Brookstanton, Harry discovered, could be ruthless. Around the same time, the first of the lawsuits against the Ministry of Magic began. The Evans Lupin Foundation had chosen it carefully. Gladwin Blythe was an elderly half-blood who had owned a small toy shop in a side street to Diagon Alley for most of his life. He was a gifted enchanter whose toys, expensive, unique and all handcrafted, were remembered fondly by several generations of pure bloods. 
Both the shop and the stock itself had been claimed by Voldemort's ministry early on. It was apparently inappropriate for a half-blood to hold such a place of relative importance to pure-bloods, not to mention that proper pure-blood children should be preparing for their place in Voldemort's empire, not play with childish toys. Blythe himself had escaped with his savings to a relative in Ireland, but wanted nothing more than to return to his life-work in London. He had not the gold, influence, or strength left to do anything about the Ministry's abysmally slow response, but the Foundation did. The resulting publicity was a slaughter. The most surprising supporter of the lawsuit to Harry's mind was Narcissa Malfoy. She had written a waspish letter to the Prophet, wondering if the Ministry was so pressed for gold that they would take generations of joy from children, and made it quite clear that should she not be able to buy those toys for her future grandchildren, toys that she had bought for her son and had herself grown up with. Then a lawsuit from a minor foundation would be the least of their problems. Harry didn't know if it was a way to improve their reputation, make life difficult for the Ministry, or something else entirely. He didn't care all that much either. Two days and some rushed paperwork later, Gladwin Blythe had received full compensation, along with an apology for his trouble. The Evans Lupin Foundation received his heartfelt gratitude and carried on with the next lawsuits, a set of three, all chosen as carefully as Blythe had been. It would take time, Harry knew. A few more lawsuits every time, each one with only marginally more issues than the previous one, until they had established solid precedents and could really get started. There was a long way from the half-blood Gladwin Blythe's established name and straightforward case to the poorest part humans and squibs, but the Foundation was patient. Two weeks into February, the second publisher caved after a week solid of borderline harassment in the Daily Profit. There was a lot of dirt to dig up on some of the companies that had managed to thrive under Voldemort's reign, and the office of Augustus Brookstanton had been extremely thorough. Paying salaries that depended on blood purity and political influence might have been appropriate a year ago, but few people were willing to put up with it now, and nobody was willing to admit to it. Doing so when some helpful soul had found photos of the owner of said business cozying up to Walden McNair during Voldemort's year in power was a public relations nightmare. The gold from the settlement went straight to the Foundation's vault with the dwarves without passing through Harry's Constantinople vault first. It would be no secret where the money came from, but once donated, it was entirely out of Harry's hands, and he was just fine with that. We spoiled him, your father, Doria reminisced the last Saturday of February when Harry was babysitting Teddy for the morning. The toddler's favourite blanket was sprawled across the floor, littered with toys, and Doria's portrait had been moved so she could follow along as well, far more than we should. We all knew that Fleamont and Euphemia would have no more children. Oh? Harry glanced at his great-aunt's portrait. Teddy took the chance to make a half-crawl, half-lunge at his favourite toy, but Harry caught him with practised ease. "'Careful there, Teddy, floor's hurt,' he said, and handed Teddy the enchanted plush dragon. The toddler laughed and waved his arms as he babbled cheerfully. He was close to his first word by now, and both Harry and Andromeda kept an ear out for it. Then Teddy put the toy in his mouth. The wings seemed to taste especially good, Harry had noticed, and proceeded to chew on it contentedly while his hair cycled slowly from reddish to a blue sort of violet. When Harry looked at the portrait again, Doria was smiling fondly. You have seen the Black family tapestry. Blacks have not lived long lives during the past few centuries. Nowhere near what an average witch or wizard should live. Some fell to enemy weapons or temperamental magic they could not control, of course, but the inbreeding demanded its price most of all. Her eyes sharpened. You carry the black madness yourself, a mere echo of it, but you still bear it four generations later. Nothing like the mad, impulsive recklessness of Sirius, nothing even close to the raw insanity that had been Bellatrix. But it was there, 
and months in grim old place had forced Harry to accept it for what it was, the single-minded stubbornness and insistence on heading straight into danger had been cultivated by a school career of useless, unhelpful teachers, a ministry full of Voldemort collaborators, and a wizarding public of spineless cowards, which meant that if anything needed to be done, he would have to bloody well do it himself. The core of it had always been there, though, that same reckless abandon he had seen in Sirius. His teenage years had merely strengthened it. Like Teddy and Tonks, Harry agreed, and stroked Teddy's soft hair. The boy was too young to change the colour of it at more than a slow pace, but he was improving week by week, month by month. There hadn't been a metamorphmagus in the Black family in two centuries. Not until Andromeda married a muggle-born, but the ability was always there, waiting for the right time. Powerful new blood, Dorea said. It fixed some of the problems of the inbred magic, at least. I found it difficult to conceive. Our son was stillborn. Euphemia's family had an abundance of children, but they had still all but given up hope when she did conceive. That is the black blood. There are ways to encourage the conception of a child, but the methods are not without drawbacks. The black family has used them liberally, but Charlouse was very clear that he would accept what magic would give us. No more and no less. No. They were both silent for a while, watching as Teddy thoroughly tasted every bit of the plush toy. Harry wondered if it was a werewolf thing or just a normal toddler thing. He'd never been around little kids much. I wish I had known them, he eventually said, a little wistful but mostly resigned. Not just my parents, but all of them. There's so much family I never had the chance to meet. Just my mum's sister and her wail of a husband and son. All I have is stories, and most of the ones I got were about pranks that my dad was involved with. People keep comparing me to my parents, but it doesn't make sense. I never knew them. No one ever taught me how a potter or an Evans or a black is supposed to act. And when someone tells me that my parents would have been proud, it's always when I've done something they personally agree with. It's never, Mr. Potter, I am severely disappointed, and you'll have detention for a month, but your mother would have been proud. It's, excellent decision, your parents would be proud, or... We left you to face Voldemort alone again, rather than do anything useful. But you survived. Your parents would be so proud. Teddy made a happy sound and turned huge, inquisitive eyes back to Harry, who winced. Your grandmother will kill me if your first word is Voldemort. Please say Grandma instead. Grandma, Grandma. Teddy laughed and squirmed a little to discard the plush dragon in favour of a brightly coloured wooden block. I never knew your mother. Doria said when Teddy had settled down again, but the Potters and the Blacks were both about family, in different ways, but they had that in common, at least. The survival and good of the family above all. <laughs> family first and power a close second. The Blacks were about dark arts, while the Potters embraced all aspects of magic, but both valued power. My parents have always been held up as the shining examples of light magic. Dorea laughed sharply. Your father was a potter of the black bloodline. I never gave up the dark arts, and Charlus never expected it. Isla Black taught her daughter the black arts, and she, in turn, taught her sons. Your father was given a solid grounding in all kinds of magic, not merely what Hogwarts teaches. He was a Gryffindor, certainly, but that does not rule out the dark arts. He had little talent for it, but he was taught nonetheless, as any child with the black blood should be. It was a strange thought, trying to merge the image of the Gryffindor prankster with a descendant of the Black Line, but what little Harry had seen also showed that James Potter had the black recklessness to him and a vicious, ruthless edge against anyone he took a disliking to. Do you think they would have been proud of me? He felt vulnerable all of a sudden, wanted to know as much as he feared the answer, but this was his great aunt, and she had known her nephew better than anyone still alive at Hogwarts had. She couldn't answer for his mother, but Harry still had to know, the one and only time he would ever ask, and the only opinion he would ever give any credit to. Not Dumbledore or the insidious Resurrection Stone, or a hundred people claiming to have known them or taught them or worked with them, his family and no one else. Your parents died to protect you, Doria said softly. So fiercely did they love you, 
All you have done since Riddle's defeat has been in the defense of your godson and those who do not have a voice of their own. I think they would have been proud beyond belief. Harry took a steadying breath. Even of a Dark Lord, even of a Dark Lord, and never let the fools of the wizarding world tell you differently. Harry arrived at the burrow the last Sunday of February like he usually did, with the crack of apparition. He had a long-standing feud with the flu, and port keys were little better. They had disabled and disconnected the flu at Grimald for security reasons, but they were perfectly capable of creating illegal port keys. Harry just preferred to stay clear of them if he could. Ron and Hermione greeted him by the door like they usually did too, like they hadn't seen each other in weeks and hadn't spent pretty much every day for the past year and a half together. Harry didn't always manage to make it to the Weasley Sunday dinners, but he joined in as often as he could. Ron and Hermione usually spent Sunday at the burrow, and instead of the two going to Grimold to meet him, Harry joined them there. Molly looked better week by week. A little bit at a time, but it was improvement, and everyone was relieved. This Sunday she greeted him with a tight hug, like always, and then held him at arm's length to look at him proper. Oh, it's so good you could make it, dear. You look a bit peaky. Andromeda had an appointment, so I had Teddy yesterday morning and most of today, Harry explained. Then I spent the rest of today child-proofing everything. I don't know how Andromeda does it every day. It was partially true. He couldn't very well explain that part of it was sheer exhaustion from trying to browbeat a new dark spell into submission the previous afternoon, with Ron and Hermione ready to help if something went hideously wrong. He had managed, but he had also been given a brutal reminder that some spells were borderline sentient and not too happy to be ordered about. "'Necessity, dear,' Molly Weasley said fondly. "'You can't do anything else with children in the house.' Then Bill and Fleur arrived, back in the burrow for the first time since Christmas, and Molly's overwhelming hugs found two new targets. Eventually they managed to move to the table that almost groaned under the amount of food, and several hours later found them happy and full. There were leftovers, but not many. Weasleys in general, Harry had noticed, seemed to have impressive appetites, but between Ron, Charlie and Bill they could decimate a dinner. Harry had noticed Bill glancing at him and Ron and Hermione several times, but thought nothing much of it. The man hadn't been back since Christmas, and had apparently been somewhere in Greece with Fleur for a job, leaving little time to catch up with the family. He was forced to take it somewhat more seriously when Bill put a hand on his arm as they got up from the table and gestured towards the stairs. "'I need to talk with you,' he said in a low, pointed voice. "'Alone.' Harry nodded and followed. There was nothing else he really could do. There was no obvious reason to say no, and no way to refuse without causing a scene and generating far more questions. Suddenly the memory of the glances during dinner became somewhat more ominous. Bill led them to Ron's old room and locked the door. The privacy wards that followed were utterly foreign to Harry and powerful enough to make Hermione envious. Harry knew he could feel her in his mind. He had opened the connection to both of his friends the moment Bill led him away. The oldest of the Weasley brood oi mate watched him for a long moment, and even Ron had no idea of what he was thinking. It wasn't the hard hostility Harry had seen him show in battle, or the casual friendliness of almost family. Harry imagined that this was the way Bill approached a particularly dangerous, unexplored tomb, and he was starting to wonder if this was a mistake. Then Bill seemed to reach a decision, and he moved, a swift, smooth gesture that turned his wand around in his hand to offer it to Harry instead, Handel first. Harry shifted uneasily. He definitely had a bad feeling about this, all three of them did, and then he accepted the wand gingerly. Bill took a small step back and held out his hands, palms flat and empty, and Hermione explained before he could ask. It's an informal request for Parley that you just accepted. It's not a vow, but... She trailed off, and Harry swallowed. It was not a vow, but it was still a borderline surrender. Bill? I am a curse breaker. Bill started carefully. A strong sensitivity to magic is all but a requirement to make it in this line of work. Would you like to tell me why my youngest brother, his girlfriend and you have all got proto-dark marks on you? 
Harry's heart skipped a beat. The sudden flood of adrenaline and cold, clammy fear kicked it back into motion, and he could feel the echoing emotions from his bondmates. Worry and apprehension from Hermione, and stubborn defiance from Ron, and he silently repeated his promise to himself. He would protect them, no matter what. Hermione's reasoning skills had already kicked in. He is in the Order, and has experience with dark magic. He probably recognised the feeling of the marks from the Death Eaters, and I heard Mum argue with Dumbledore about Bill once. She didn't want him reading those books from Grimold, from Ron, and... Harry took a slow breath to calm himself a little and gather their thoughts before he answered. Dumbledore had you researching the marks. That's why no one else has caught us yet. You need the sensitivity and the experience, and most people don't have even one of those. Why approach me about it? Why not Ron? He didn't try to deny it. He was pretty sure that would be a lost cause. Bill's hands were still held out, the perfect image of non-aggression, and that was the only reason why Harry still had his wand angled slightly downwards and not aimed straight at Bill. Ron's the tactician. Hermione is the brains. Neither of them would do something like this without your agreement. The long silence in his mind was a little uncomfortable, but none of the three could think of anything to say in disagreement to that. It's not a dark mark, Harry finally corrected him, using knowledge that Hermione offered him. Voldemort further corrupted a slave mark created by a dark lord in the 1500s. This isn't a slave mark, it's a mental bond and a connection as equals. It's still soul magic, Bill pointed out mildly. And I will testify under Veritas Serum that Ron and Hermione broke no laws. Neither of them ever cast the spell. I've stepped on enough toes that no one would question it. They'll be more than willing to pin it on me. We've all seen wizarding justice in action. That's ten years in Azkaban? Harry snorted. Not for the saviour, he disagreed, just a little bitter about yet another title. I'd be sent through the veil, or acquitted, depending on whether I was currently a dark lord in the making, or a tragic hero, bravely risking my life to protect my friends. Bill nodded slowly, expression unreadable. And are you? Dark lord, or tragic hero? Harry's lips twisted, not quite in amusement. You'll have to a little more precise, Weasley. Someone in his mind? It felt like Ront took a sharp breath that echoed as emotions through the bond. Mate, definitely Ron. No, I'm done. If he wants an answer, he can ask. Neville had the guts to do it. A Gringotts-trained curse-breaker can do the same. Bill's eyes narrowed. That answer alone had probably been plenty to work it out. All right, Lord Potter. Do you really expect the wizarding world to just go along with it when we only just got rid of the last Dark Lord? I don't know. Harry snapped back. Do you have any other convenient chosen ones to dump the job on? His name was Voldemort, Tom Riddle, if you want to be accurate, and based on how the wizarding world reacted to him, I bloody well expect them to roll over and obey, because that's what they did the last two times. And you roped in my brother and his girlfriend. I tried to talk my two best friends out of it, but you should know how well that works on a Gryffindor. Bill's hand twitched. Harry wondered if the man was starting to regret giving up his wand, but he kept a tight grip on it and a shield a heartbeat away. Says the Gryffindor Dark Lord to be? Harry's answering smile bordered on malicious. The hat wanted me in Slytherin, and Voldemort would have rewarded you with a crucio for talking back. Terrible Gryffindor thing to do to someone you think is a Dark Lord, isn't it? Harry! Hermione this time! Harry ignored her, his full attention on the possible threat in front of him. You wouldn't attack an unarmed man. Harry tapped the two wands against his hand. You sound awfully sure about that. Bill took a sharp breath, the gesture painfully similar to the way Ron reacted sometimes, and this time the insistent words in his mind got through. Bloody hell, Harry, what are you doing? Pushing him, Harry said bluntly, Harry! Ron and Hermione wouldn't follow a new Voldemort. Bill almost didn't hesitate when he spoke the name. Harry was reluctantly impressed. I might not have given them a choice. Gryffindor impulsiveness and all, so easy to lead around as long as you give them a cause to fight so bravely for. It was easy to find the words, easy to goad the oldest Weasley son. 
Harry had spent far too long listening to Snape and the visions of Voldemort, and the Slytherin mindset came easy to him now. He would never be the silver tongue that the young Tom Riddle had been, would never have the razor-sharp insults of Severus Snape, but he at least had other people's expectations to play on. Their expectations and their reactions when he failed to live up to them. He didn't have to sound perfectly like a Dark Lord. More likely than not, any listener would add the needed venom and undercurrent of threats to his words themselves. Bill's expression sharpened. Harry's grip on the two wands tightened when he felt a whisper of a movement in them. Wandless, wordless magic, Weasley, he said with deceptive mildness. I thought you were here under Parley. Accidental magic, Bill answered blandly. At your age, how embarrassing. Forgive me for being a little startled hearing the Gryffindor golden boy talk like a would-be dark lord. Bill snorted. Nice job baiting me, though. I know Ron better than that, at least, and I like to think I know Hermione well enough to call bull on that, too. For long seconds, the room was silent as they watched each other carefully. We can't obliviate him, Hermione said. Who knows how long he's been suspecting us? He's trustworthy, Ron disagreed. He's a Weasley. Even Percy turned out all right in the end. Hermione didn't feel convinced. Enough to trust him with this? He was a member of the Order. He helped protect Harry, protect all of us. I bloody well trust him. We trusted George and Neville too. And we know George and Neville a lot better than Bill too. He's your brother, but Harry barely knows him and I've only spoken with him a few times when he has visited. He's Bill! He bloody well fought in the battle. If that's not good enough, what is? Harry didn't speak but let them argue, watching Bill all the while. Ron is arguing for you, he finally said. The mental argument stopped instantly. Hermione isn't sure, but she's also aware a quick obliviate is not an option. Who knows how long you have suspected us, much less what insurances you decided to bring with you to confront me. Bill nodded slowly. Harry was impressed he hadn't felt the wand strain against another unspoken summoning spell. He could imagine himself in Bill's place, his fate being discussed by an unseen council, and his weapon in the hands of someone who had openly admitted intentions of dark lordship, and not knowing if he would have to duck a memory charm or worse any moment. He doubted he would have been able to look as calm. That, or Bill, was that secure in his own abilities. Harry wasn't about to underestimate someone hired by the goblins, but he was also well aware of his own strengths and weaknesses, thanks to Ron and Hermione. George has incriminated himself with us, Harry said. The slightly frigid feeling from Hermione let him know she did not appreciate the reminder of their dead prisoner. Neville hasn't, not to the same extent, but he has offered to help us. How is the contract coming along? Hermione hesitated. I need a little while longer to work on it. We can't risk a mistake. And if we don't have that... Ron took a deep breath that echoed through the bond. Tell him that if you're going to Azkaban, I'm going with you. Tell him I said that. Ron, I know you're stupidly self-sacrificing and would probably do something incredibly dumb to keep us out of it. But that doesn't matter. If he rats on you, he's condemning all of us. Tell him that. I trust him, but tell him that. He's a Weasley. He won't like it, but he won't turn his back on me. He could be convinced I'm controlling you and decide to do something about it, Harry pointed out quite reasonably. Ron paused, maybe. But he knows me and he knows I'd do it. Tell him. Harry nodded, even if his friends couldn't see it. Bill's stance shifted in response. Ron says he trusts you. He also says that if I'm going to Azkaban, he's going with me and to tell you that. Bill stilled for a moment. Then his shoulders dropped slightly and he sighed. He would. Weasley stubbornness at its finest. All right, Potter, what are your goals? No harm in revealing that, and it could potentially see Bill somewhat more positive towards their cause. A safe society for my godson? It sounded so simple when he put it like that, a little obsessive too, and maybe that was the black blood in him talking. Even half mad from Azkaban, Sirius had been relentlessly single-minded about his few causes, the death of Wormtail and the safety of Harry himself, for what little he had actually been able to do as a wanted man. Bill watched him carefully. Very altruistic for a Dark Lord. Harry shrugged. It doesn't make me any less of a dark lord when the Ministry, the Wizengamot, and a number of backwater wizarding prejudices stand in my way. 
Make no mistake. I've spent seven years witnessing the best wizarding justice and politics had to offer, and I'm not impressed. Even if Teddy isn't targeted by werewolf legislation now, what sort of society will he grow up in, as a second-rate citizen for being part human, even, since Remus was a werewolf? Condemned to reservation, maybe? That's what they were planning for werewolves in the original vote, after all. Maybe he will have a proper pure blood as charms teacher, if he's actually allowed at Hogwarts. Professor Flitwick is part goblin, after all. And we're overdue another rebellion. Can't have someone related to those spiteful little creatures teaching children, after all. Harry's mockery of a pure-blood supremacist rant seemed to hit a little too close to home. Bill's eyes narrowed again. It doesn't have to be like that. Vila in France have the same rights as humans. And here they don't, Harry said bluntly. I'm surprised Fleur is willing to visit this country at all. But if she's smart, she keeps an eye on politics. Get advance notice before they decide that part Vila are dark creatures too. Hagrid's a good man, but too stupid to realise he'll be a target sooner rather than later for having giant blood. That definitely hit too close to home. The wand in his hand shifted again and Harry felt a charge in the air from barely restrained magic. We didn't fight Voldemort twice just for another Dark Lord to take over, no matter how supposedly good his reasons are. No, Harry agreed. You tried and failed to defeat him twice, left the job to my mum and me, and then proceeded to continue with the same damn thing that resulted in Voldemort in the first place. Blatant discrimination and racism. You're right, that's so much better. The charge between them burned sharper and snapped with an audible crack as the magic grew too heavy. Harry's silent protego slammed into place a half-second later with the merciless instincts of someone used to fighting for their life, and Bill took a sharp breath. His wand was still in Harry's hand, and he held out both hands, palms up and empty. Bloody hell, he breathed. I forgot how good your reflexes are. I supposed I should thank you for not cursing me. Harry held the shield and let long seconds tick onwards before he finally lowered it. Ron trusts you, and you haven't tried to kill me yet. No crucio. Bill sounded only half-joking. Harry swallowed. I am not Voldemort. No, Bill said softly. But if you want to change wizarding society on such a fundamental level, you may well have to be, and then we will meet on the battlefield. I can't support that, no matter how good the cause is. Harry... Hermione trailed off, and he knew what she was asking. Talk to Ron, talk to Hermione, we have contingency plans in place. Bill paused. All right, I will. A heartbeat, then. My wand? Harry held it out, handle first like Bill had done, and the curse-breaker visibly relaxed as the wand changed hands once more. Then he took down the wards with practised ease, nodded once at Harry, and left the room. I guess it could have gone worse. Hermione just sighed. It wasn't all hard work, practising spells under the Fidelius. Some spells demanded more than Ron and Hermione could manage. The Fidelius would remain the prime example, but a lot of them they learned together. The weather on Harry's hideaway wasn't always the best, but they had spells for that too, and they had come to look forward to some of their more spectacular attempts. Muggle-repelling wards took care of any interest that they might draw. Muniminis! Ron cast on Lazy Tuesday in early March with the cheerful enthusiasm of a first year. The ground around him hiccuped in a perfect circle before it settled again. You need more of a jab at the end, Hermione shouted from where she watched the proceedings with Harry, well away from Ron. Ron jabbed. The circle of dirt wobbled and sunk back into place. Muniminis! He tried again with a little more care in his motions, and this time the ground responded proper. A circular wall of dirt some seven feet tall rose straight from the ground around him. They couldn't see Ron behind it, but they definitely saw the effects when the wall detached itself and started to spin while moving outwards. As it pushed out further, it became clear that the wall was getting thinner too, and by the time it had been pushed a good thirty yards away from Ron, it looked more like a slowly spinning tornado made up of lumps of dirt and grass. Inside the construct, through the web of dirt, they saw Ron move his wand in circles above his head, and the wall sped up, faster and faster with each circle. 
It was a visually impressive defence, not as durable as stone, but a good foundation to build on, and it worked brilliantly until Ron seemed to spin his wand just a little too fast and the dirt shot upwards as if fired from a cannon. The great cloud hung above them for an impossibly long second. Then gravity pulled it back, and only three hastily cast shield charms kept them from being covered in dirt and plant bits. A cascade of debris landed around them and were deflected by the shields. The sound of wet dirt hitting equally wet grass was just another reason for Harry to be grateful for magic and the wonders of shields. In the middle of the mess, Ron looked on with a wide-eyed expression. Then he looked at Hermione and opened and closed his mouth a few times. I, uh, was as far as he got before Hermione interrupted him. You were supposed to keep focusing! The last few small leaves drifted down and settled on Harry's shield, and he laughed even as Hermione proceeded to chew out their friend about the dangers of rogue spells. There was no possible way they weren't going back to Grimold covered in mud and plants that evening, magic or not. It was entirely worth it. The Goblin Rebellion of 1999 began the last Friday of March, right before Hogwarts sent the students home for Easter. Harry had no doubts the timing was deliberate. He was only surprised they hadn't decided to wait until the last day of the school year or the day the Hogwarts letter went out just for added chaos. Hogwarts itself would, for the first time that anyone could remember, close entirely for Easter to continue the ongoing reconstruction. From what they had heard from Ginny, Neville and Luna, though, even the fifth and seventh year students would have been likely to go home anyway, rather than stay and study. The memories of Hogwarts were still dark and imposing, and all the more so in a mostly empty castle. The goblins, spiteful little bastards that they were, knew perfectly well that there was about to be an influx of students coming home, and thus families in need of galleons to go shopping with their offspring. Gringotts closed its massive doors on the morning of the 26th of March, two hours before the Hogwarts Express was due to depart for King's Cross. The Ministry of Magic responded by sending a small delegation of one so-called Goblin Expert, a ministry official and two auras to clear up the obvious misunderstanding. Gringotts responded by slaughtering the four of them and leaving the decapitated bodies on the steps before the bank. Less than 11 months after the last battle, Wizarding Britain was officially at war again. The goblin demands were published in The Prophet the following day. The Ministry had apparently not been happy with that, but since the original list had been left on the doors of Gringotts itself, there was little they could do about it. Harry could sort of understand why the Ministry didn't want the list to be public knowledge. The demands were plain, sharply worded, but summed up to equal rights. The right to a wand, the right to representation in the Ministry, the right to live beyond the tunnels under Gringotts. Everything a good part of a soft-heated public would be very understanding of when the alternative was another war so shortly after the last one ended. Sure, the goblins were a little angry and unpleasant, but certainly that would improve with a little respect, and it was so very inconvenient not to have ready access to galleons. The demands were complete and utter bull, in Harry's not particularly kind opinion. The goblins, by their very nature, didn't give a damn about living above ground, but it would give them an excellent opportunity to set up fortifications to use in a future rebellion. Representation in the Ministry was useless, as a number of part humans could attest to, and the goblins had to know that too. It would, however, give them access to the Ministry buildings, which was far more than they had now. Only the right to a wand wasn't complete bull, and they'd been fighting for that right for as long as they had been in Britain. Considering that they had fought the wizarding world to a standstill repeatedly, without wands, giving in to that demand was tantamount to suicide. The goblins knew it, the ministry knew it, Harry knew it, but a good amount of the wizarding unfortunately did not, or simply refused to acknowledge it. Harry was frankly surprised that his dead body wasn't on the list of demands. Then again, he was still the saviour and man who won, and whatever else they called him these days, and demanding his life, or even just blaming him for the rebellion, was likely to backfire spectacularly. 
those people still sympathetic to goblin demands of equal rights would be significantly less sympathetic if the demands included the heads of perfectly respectable wizards or witches. It didn't mean he wasn't a target, and he knew that. It felt strangely familiar, knowing that a powerful force was after his life again. He was already a target of the remaining free Death Eaters and assorted crazies of the wizarding world. Having the goblins actively out for his blood and not just a standing threat of execution if he set foot in Gringotts wasn't that much of a change. The Hogwarts Express had arrived the prior evening under heavy security. Ron and Hermione had been there with the Weasleys to greet Ginny and their friends. Harry, sensibly, had stayed at home and spent the day checking the protections on his house. When he saw his friends again on Saturday evening, they arrived with a packed dinner from Molly Weasley and an enormous treacle tart for dessert. Mum says thank you, Ron greeted him as they settled their cargo on the floor between them. Molly Weasley did not believe in shrinking food unnecessarily. A feather-light charm, certainly, but food just didn't taste the same when it had been shrunk. They got everything out of Gringotts? Harry knew Ron had brought it up to them, but he had no idea if they'd actually done it. Yeah, they moved it to the dwarves. Bill had warned them, too. Bit of a travel, Dad says. And the goblins weren't happy, but better than having no galleons at all. Unlike a lot of other wizards and witches in Britain, went unspoken. Why keep more than you had to at home when Gringotts was far safer? Harry wondered briefly how families like the Malfoys fared. For all that bins went on and on about goblin rebellions, most people had seemed quick to assume it was a thing of the past. The Malfoys, at least, had a heavily protected manner and intimate experience with the fickleness of politics and the dangers of risking everything on one bet. Harry wouldn't be surprised if they had a generous amount of galleons hidden away for those unpleasant little surprises. For the moment the situation was tense. Once on hand gold started to run out, it would get worse. Fast. Ministers had been toppled for far less, even popular ones like Shacklebolt. I'm guessing Bill's permanently out of a job. Mum's kind of happy, Ron admitted. She never liked the dangerous stuff much. Charlie's bad enough. Fleur mentioned that he's already got other offers, though. Hermione added. Gringotts isn't the only ones to employ curse breakers. They're merely the biggest employer in Britain. He made a lot of contacts in Egypt, apparently, and Fleur knows a number of interested people in France. Yeah, that part Mum wasn't happy with. Might be better for them, though, Harry said. France has equal rights for Vila. I don't know about Egypt, but France would be a lot better for them than Britain would, what with Fleur being part Vila and all. There wasn't much any of them could say to that. Instead, they brought the massive basket to the table and set up dinner. Harry enjoyed the company and suspected that after a full day of Weasley chaos, Ron and Hermione enjoyed the silence. The food was everything Harry loved about Molly Weasley's cooking, and even with Ron's appetite, there were plenty of leftovers. The treacle tart was amazing, and it was only when most of it was gone and all three of them had eaten far more than they should that their conversation drifted to heavier topics again. It'll be bad, Ron said when the plates had been removed by mute and a bottle of fire whiskey opened and tasted. When the Ministry steps in, they have to. It's just a question of whether the goblins attack first or they do. Couple of days and the outcry will start. Then the stupider people will start to hammer on the door and demand to be let in. And then the auras, when the goblins strike back, Hermione said softly. If you had taken up Shacklebolt's offer of acceptance in the programme, you would have been preparing for war again. We already are, Harry said equally soft, just not in the Ministry's name. Ron picked up the bottle and refilled his glass. The fire whiskey bubbled and burped a small blue flame. Ron tapped the glass a few more times just to see the dancing flames. He's going to show up anyway. Shacklebolt. You know it, Harry. You're still the hero of the wizarding world and all that. You're not an aura, but they'll want every one they can get and it'd be great publicity. You know, as long as you didn't get killed. He paused. Actually, even if you got killed. Sorry, mate, but it's true. A martyr's a lot easier to work with. Ron! Harry snorted. 
What? It's the truth. I don't know if they're calling in the trainee auras too, but you can bet that if Ron and I had signed up for the auras, we would have been right in the middle of it, trainees or not. Probably going to blame us too. Just because, Ron added. He drowned the fire whiskey and grimaced at the burn. Bloody hell! And we were so sure the world would be fine after Voldemort kicked it. Get the chance to be stupid for a while and celebrate, settle down, get a job, get married, raise a Quidditch team worth of Cannons fans. Harry glanced at Hermione before he could stop himself. She sighed and reached over to grab the bottle from Ron. It's going to be one of those nights. Give me that. A shot of fire whiskey later, and she passed the bottle to Harry and slumped back in her chair. It didn't work. The first months were great, then we started to argue about stupid, inconsequential things, about books, about laundry, about table manners. Merlin, we argued about the profit. That's when we both figured it was a lost cause, Ron agreed quietly. Then we tried as friends, and it worked a lot better. Harry nodded slowly and wasn't sure how he felt about it. It wasn't like he had talked to them about Ginny either, although it seemed to be pretty common knowledge that they weren't dating these days. He poured a large shot and passed the bottle to Ron. It seemed the proper thing to do. We haven't told anyone, Hermione admitted. We haven't even told Mum, Ron stared at the bottle. Everyone expects us to marry. Everyone expects me to become an aura or something and Hermione to change the world. Bloody hell. This time last year we were fighting for our lives. We share a room and that's it, but no one's as much as noticed. Harry winced slightly. He'd been wondering a little, but he didn't have much experience with relationships. And he'd had a lot of other things to worry about. He hadn't figured it was his place to barge in. Now he regretted it a little. The fire whiskey seemed to have opened a floodgate, and Ron seemed relieved to finally talk with no expectations hanging over him. Mum expects a proposal and marriage. What happens if we tell them it didn't work out? They wouldn't kick out Hermione, but Mum would make her sleep in another room because it wouldn't be proper, and we still can't sleep alone with those nightmares. Then she'd start setting us up with people, good proper witches and wizards for her baby boy and adoptive daughter, and all they'll see is the chance to hook up with a war hero and make a little fame from it. Harry was silent for long moments. Then he sighed. I kissed Ginny the day after Halloween. She wanted to know, she said, so I did, and something was missing, I guess. She knew it would never work, and I think I knew somewhere, too. She's, she has the chance at Hogwarts to be something more. Have a boyfriend that doesn't wake up from a nightmare and destroys the door because he thought it was a Death Eater, someone who won't have his whole bloody life dictated by prophecy. The fire whiskey looked downright nice now. Harry downed it and grimaced as it burned all the way down. He had probably poured a lot more than he should have. Hermione made a sound that was half laugh and half sob. Merlin, we're a great team! Harry's hand closed over hers only half a second after Ron's did, and for a long time they just sat there, hands clenched tightly and not speaking. Then Harry cleared his throat. You can move in here! I know you wanted to stay at the burrow, but if you want it, most of the house is repaired, and I have more rooms than I'll ever know what to do with. It's not particularly nice, and it'll probably be raided by auras one of these days, but it's warded, and it's yours for as long as you want it. Hermione wiped her eyes with the sleeve of her free hand. You have such a way with words. Oh, Ron! Ron looked up, and in that moment he looked so tired and so relieved that Harry's heart twisted in sympathy. We wanted to stay for Mum, but she's doing better now. We... I needed the company, but it's getting too much. Yes, Merlin, yeah. Yes, and thank you, Hermione said softly. She took a shuddering breath and let go of their hands again. After Easter, when Hogwarts starts up again. Give Mum time to get used to the idea, Ron asked. Yeah, maybe at the end of April is better. It's yours, Harry agreed, whenever you want it. The rest of the night vanished in a haze of fire whiskey. But the promise remained, and Grim Old Place felt just a little more like home. By Monday morning, when Gringotts remained a silent, locked-down fortress, people had started to become worried. Harry personally thought they should have been worried the moment Gringotts closed its doors, but no one had ever accused the wizarding world of being sensible. 
A few particularly foolish or desperate people had hammered on the doors to be let in, unaware, or simply not caring, that they were standing in the same spot where goblins had left four decapitated bodies just days prior. Fortunately for their future health and well-being, no one had responded, and they had left again eventually, complaining all the while. A few dozen people had gathered in the ministry atrium to protest, according to the wireless. Harry wasn't sure what they possibly hoped to accomplish, but the auras had quickly and firmly sent them on their way. Shoppers skittered around Diagon Alley like mice in an owlery. The atmosphere felt like the minutes before a thunderstorm. The Prophet brought out their biggest fonts, probably in an attempt to make people not notice that the only pictures they had were of the closed doors of Gringotts and some unhappy-looking auras. Harry was resoundingly unimpressed. By Wednesday morning, the last day of March, Grimold Place received a most distinguished visitor. The Gringotts situation had turned from an annoyance and somewhat of a concern to an increasingly large problem by then. Thursday morning, the ministry salaries would be due. They would be able to hand out the appropriate pay slips, but that would do little good when no one could get to Gringotts to exchange it to decent, reliable gold. Few wizarding stores were willing to accept credit. Fewer still were willing to do it during a goblin rebellion without massive compensation for the risk they would take on the gold. Negotiating had done nothing. Harry, Ron and Hermione had all kept up with the situation as much as they could through the biased views of the Prophet, and after days of absolutely no news of progress, the paper had started to fill up with a number of letters from its readers. They ranged from raving pro-goblin demands to agree to everything to open Gringotts again, to equally raving anti-goblin demands to see the entire goblin nation driven from Britain. All of them presented an increasingly pressing issue for the Ministry. Perhaps, then, it should not have been surprising to find Grimold hosting the grand presence of the Minister along with a small guard detail. There had been little notice given, merely a request for a meeting and the Minister arriving mere minutes later. Shacklebolt looked visibly tired, but Harry would have been surprised otherwise, what with everything that was going on. His guard detail, four auras, looked somewhat on edge, though in their defence, Grimold was still noticeably dark, but let Shacklebolt raise a privacy spell around himself and Harry nonetheless. Harry wasn't about to assume they wouldn't be told everything anyway, but he supposed it was a nice gesture. It wasn't like he wasn't broadcasting everything to Ron and Hermione anyway. The three of you successfully broke into Gringotts and escaped during the war. Shacklebolt skipped straight past pleasantries and right to the point. Harry didn't respond to that. It was a somewhat well-known fact that most people dismissed as an exaggerated rumour, in part because the goblins vehemently denied it, and Harry had never talked about it. Uh, we have very little information about the interior of Gringotts beyond the publicly accessible areas. What we do have is a fifty years or more out of date. I can't imagine they didn't increase security after what we did, Harry said. I didn't notice anything last time I visited. I had other things to worry about, but they would be idiots not to. I'd say you would have better luck with someone like Bill or Fleur Weasley, who've actually worked with the goblins. Kingsley looked a little pained. We tried. They refused. Their contracts carry heavy penalties for betraying the trust of the goblin nation, even after their employment is over. The Ministry's previous information came from a human clerk. When the goblins discovered it, his property was seized by Gringotts, and he vanished in the middle of the night. The official story was that he fled the country. Unofficially, his family used the dark arts to track him. The trail led to Gringotts, but was extinguished before actions could be taken. That sounded like a very polite way to say killed. Gruesomely, too, knowing goblins. That doesn't exactly encourage us to help. You're not under the same contracts. No, we are, however, on incredibly bad terms with the goblins. We'd prefer not to make it any worse. Half truth, half lie. Harry didn't want to deal with a goblin nation actively out for his blood, and not just banning him from Gringotts under the pain of death. There were still people out there he would cheerfully have pissed off the goblins for. The minister just wasn't one of them. He understood on some level why Shacklebolt had approached him, but he didn't have to like it. 
They had done enough already, all three of them, and Harry had absolutely no delusions that the goblins wouldn't somehow find out he had been involved. When it came to secrets, the ministry was as secure as a broken locking spell and half as useful. Shacklebolt watched him for a long time. Then he nodded slowly. Harry was a bit surprised the man hadn't pulled out the we-could-save-a-lot-of-lives-with-that-information tactic, but he supposed Shacklebolt knew better. He had always been good at reading people. There have been a number of lawsuits, the man said, abruptly changing the topic. Every time one compensation is settled, two more suits are filed. Are you planning to bury the ministry in paperwork? Harry shrugged. The foundation is out of my hands, minister. You have nothing to do with the Evans Lupin Foundation? Shacklebolt asked dryly, stressing the name. I funded it, I signed the paperwork, and then I handed it into capable hands. I wanted the settlement money to do to a good cause. The foundation ensures it happens. We have enough to do with a goblin rebellion without fighting another war in court. Then perhaps the ministry should have handled the compensation sooner. You seem to think it's a matter of deliberate stubbornness. The paperwork alone has taken months to go through. Would you prefer we just handed out galleons and property to whoever argued the loudest and simply ignore it later when it turns out they were lying? Everything after the first fall of Voldemort was a rush job. I would prefer to avoid making the same mistakes, Shacklebolt said pointedly. I would prefer not to see another innocent in Azkaban, he didn't say, and didn't have to. Harry stilled, magic roiled right beneath his skin under a paper-thin sheet of ice. And how long will you use that excuse, Harry said with deceptive mildness. The trial's finished in September. If you can ensure obviously fair and unbiased trials over just a summer, how long did you expect us to simply accept that it's different when the Ministry is the one supposed to pay and not whatever Death Eater you handed out a fine to? Shacklebolt was equally still for a moment. Harry wondered if he regretted visiting yet. There is very little the Ministry can do to convince you of its good intentions, isn't there? He stated more than asked. Can you blame me? Shacklebolt watched him for a long time. Even knowing that people you trust are working to improve it now? If not me, will you trust people like Arthur and Percy Weasley? I trust them not to approve of legislation that will potentially see my godson reduced to a second-class citizen. Shacklebolt closed his eyes for a moment, and Harry hadn't noticed until then that he looked far more tired than he used to, even when the war was at its bloodiest. I don't control the Wizengamot. I can't control the Wizengamot. True, Harry agreed. Still doesn't make me trust the Ministry in the slightest. Most Muggleborn had their property confiscated and have yet to have it returned. The rest managed to get what they could out in time and kept it elsewhere. Their Gringotts vaults were supposedly safe, but that didn't matter much if you couldn't get to Gringotts safely in the first place. A number of them still keep their gold elsewhere in case things go bad again. The remaining Gringotts clients, as I understand it, are mostly pure bloods, half bloods that manage to keep their head down during Voldemort's occupation and the occasional muggle born that should have known better. Tell me, Minister. Why am I supposed to care about one group of Voldemort collaborators squabbling with another? Some, not all. There are innocents caught in the middle. Harry shrugged. I warned the people I care about. I notice he didn't make it into the profit. Remarkable discretion. I am eighteen years old, Minister. I fought in the war against the darkest wizard of this century from the age of eleven. I willingly walked to my death at seventeen for a useless, ungrateful wizarding public. I've done my part. I don't see what I owe to the same people that gleefully called me a delusional liar last time I brought back bad news. It would probably have triggered a goblin rebellion right there, and then it would have been blamed on me, as always. I assume you have no gold caught in Gringotts, then? Harry snorted. What do you think, Minister? They have made it quite clear that they will kill me if I ever set foot there again. I claimed every vault I could on my own and Teddy's behalf and had them transferred immediately. There was a bit of genuine curiosity in Shacklebolt's dark eyes. Where did you move it? It was almost the Shacklebolt, Harry remembered from the war but not enough to make up for trying to manipulate him into being a tame pet for the Ministry of Magic. Elsewhere, 
he said blandly. Well out of the Ministry's reach. I've heard great things about the dwarves, though. Shacklebolt frowned. Harry. The headmaster was big on forgiveness and second chances, Harry said firmly. I am not Albus Dumbledore. No, Shacklebolt said quietly, and with a bit of that grave disappointment that the headmaster always excelled in. You're not. A year ago, that disappointment would probably have made Harry cave. These days, he found he gave preciously little thought to it. Was that smart? Hermione asked, worried in the back of his mind, when Shacklebolt and his guard detail had left, making enemies this soon. I find, Harry admitted, that I'm rapidly losing my ability to care. We hope you enjoyed this chapter. Please consider supporting our project by joining our Patreon linked in the description. Or become a member here on YouTube, where you will get access to several additional chapters weeks before they release on YouTube.